Hello, uh, I'm Laura Harris. I am the Distance and Open Education Librarian, and today I'm going to be talking to you about OER. And give me just a moment to share my screen. So the title of this session uh, is Fed Up with Expensive Textbooks. And uh, open educational resources are just uh, one solution. Uh, I am not sure if Dan Laird has already done his session uh, during spring breakout, but he's talking about another option called inclusive access. Um, while that is not free, <laughs> um, OER usually uh, are free um, or very, very low cost. And the low cost uh, that's sometimes associated with OER um, tends to come with some sort of value added. Um, like uh, personalized or adaptive learning uh, tools integrated with that. Um, though those can be free to students as well. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that in a moment. So uh, let me first define what open educational resources are. Um, they're really any sort of open edge, uh, really any sort of educational resource from textbooks, lesson plans, um, their entire courses out there. Um, and the open part uh, refers to usually uh, the item being in the public domain or having a Creative Commons license. I think we all know that educational resources have been shared far and wide for many, many years um, before open educational resources existed and probably long, long before the Creative Commons existed. Um, and the Creative Commons, uh, I believe was started about 15 years ago. I should know this, but uh, I think that's about when it uh, sort of came to fruit, maybe uh, closer to 20 years. But um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the Creative Commons because it is gonna be relevant when you are looking uh, at OER. And that will define how you can use the OER as well. So there are a few different elements to the Creative Commons licenses. And I am on the Creative Commons website. So the underlying uh, characteristic of all the Creative Commons licenses, uh, except CC0, which we'll get to, uh, is that you should give it attribution, which uh, as a librarian, and I think anyone who's watching who is teacher of any sort uh, can probably is rejoicing at that because we all want our students to give attribution to their original sources. Uh, and attribution, uh, they say by here, that's their little shorthand and the little stick figure is the uh, glyph that they use to indicate that. The next element is share alike, and that's shortened into SA, and it has kind of like a backward reload button on your browser. Kind of hard to see the arrow here, but uh, that's what it looks like. And basically, share alike means that you can make any changes to the item, um, but you have to make sure you release it under the same license. Um, and let me just go back because I realized I forgot a very important point about uh, attribution. Basically, if it has a CC by license, you can do anything you'd like with it. You can modify it, um, add to it, combine it with other things, uh, distribute it, make a zillion copies. Um, you can even sell it. You just need to make sure that you are giving attribution to the original creator. Um, so we talked about the attribution. Uh, the share alike. The next one is um, attribution non-commercial. So basically you can do what you would like with it uh, if you're not making money off of it. Um, it is a little bit more complicated than that um, in terms of commercial uses. Um, but for the purposes of this session, which is a short session, uh, we can just say non-commercial uses um, no money making from the non-commercial license. Uh, then we have the CC by NC, which is non-commercial, share alike. And everything, actually, 
never mind. Uh, so this is a fairly limited license. The more elements you add here, the more limiting it is. Um, so for this license, they you can do whatever you'd like with the material, but you have to release it under the same license and you cannot make money from it. Um, and you may see the, um, the little glyph for non-commercial is the dollar sign here, but uh, depending on what country uh, of origin the material is in, you may see a different uh, monetary symbol like a, a euro symbol or a pound symbol or something of that sort. Um, the equal sign is for non-derivative. And basically that means you can uh, distribute it, make as many copies as you'd like. You do have to give attribution, of course, um, and you cannot make any changes. Now, there is a, an exception to this, and that is changing it to another format. Um, so if you're changing it, for example, from a um, written text into an audio file, uh, that kind of derivative is uh, allowed. It's explicitly allowed by the Creative Commons licenses. Um, and unfortunately, OER are not always accessible, uh, just like any other work. But um, I do think that's uh, something nice about uh, the Creative Commons licenses is that even the non-derivative license gives you that freedom to make alternate versions um, that may be used by uh, people with different um, barriers. And then the last one we have here is um, CC by uh, non-commercial non-derivative. So that is the most limiting one. You cannot make any money off of it. You cannot make any changes to it. Um, and of course you have to give attribution. So um, the very last one, I mentioned this a few moments ago, is CC zero. Now there are a few, this basically means that the person who created it is putting it into the public domain. Uh, things can go into the public domain in a variety of ways. Um, I think the way that most of us are used to things being in the public domain is that they have aged out. Um, you know, for example, Jane Austen or um, Ellen Montgomery and the Anne of Green Gables books, those sorts of things are in the public domain because they're a bit older. Um, however, if somebody has dedicated it to the public domain, then you don't have that whole uh, waiting period. It's just in the public domain. And things that are in the public domain, you do not have to give attribution to. Um, as an academic, I think it's always a good idea to give attribution uh, if you can. So uh, even though it's not required, I think it's a good practice. So let's go back here to our OER page. So I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of open educational resources. Um, I think the most obvious uh, benefit is that it saves students money. Um, that's what got me interested in open educational resources uh, a few years back. Uh, luckily, um, textbook costs have big gun to drop a little bit um, as of a few years ago, um, but they're still outrageously expensive. And uh, over the period uh, between 2006 and 2016, uh, the cost of college textbooks rose far more steeply than the rest of the consumer price index uh, over that same period of time. So uh, even though it's started to taper off now, uh, we still have that 10-year uh, period to sort of make up for. And um, prior to the pandemic, uh, our student association here at Oswego actually had said that uh, lowering textbook costs was one of their priorities. So uh, it is something that our students here are definitely feeling. Um, and again, we don't really know what the long-term effects of COVID are going to be on our economy, um, but I think we're already seeing some effects in academia. Um, so it's something to consider that people who may not have been affected um, may be affected in the future. Um, 
SUNY actually has given for the last few years since 2017, I believe, given $4 million to the entire SUNY system uh, and also $4 million to the CUNY system um, to um, advocate for, um, encourage adoption of, encourage creation of uh, open educational resources. And um, between 2017 and 2019, uh, they've saved students $47 million. Um, so I think that's an 11 times return on investment. So it's pretty good return on investment. Um, and one of the other things, of course, is that it is lasting access. Uh, students will always have access to it. And um, it's immediate, which I know just working at the library is a concern. Uh, we always have students at the beginning of the semester coming to the library and think, do you have my textbook? Um, and we always have to say, oh, we don't have the current version, but we have the version from last year or three years ago. Um, and you know, with students trying to find the lowest cost for items, um, they may have to wait for student loan dispersals or they may have to wait um, for something to arrive from Amazon or what have you. So that is another benefit of OER. They have it on the first day. Um, and I believe there is some research that uh, shows that that is uh, beneficial to students and to uh, learning outcomes for the course in general. So uh, let's move on and talk about how OER can benefit you. Um, I think the biggest benefit is, uh, first of all, going back to the student thing, knowing your students have access on the first day of class, uh, I think comes with its own reassurance. Uh, but there is an element of academic freedom there. Um, you know, a typical textbook covers a specific set of topics in a specific order, um, since most OER, the ones with uh, that do not have the non-derivative license can be modified. So you can restructure things in to an order that makes sense for you and the way you like to teach the material. Um, you can remove topics, add topics, uh, revise outdated information and add more up-to-date information, uh, which is obviously I think important in this day and age because we probably have a lot of things that need to be updated. Um, and of course you can mix and match. Uh, I'm actually working with a faculty member in Calm Studies who I believe is tying in, she's creating um, a text out of three different existing OER. Uh, so that's kind of neat. So um, that's OER in a nutshell. I'm gonna quickly go over how you can find OER. Uh, I've created this list that um, covers OER in a variety of subject areas. Um, if you do not see your subject area here, um, you can always let me know and I will uh, see what I can find in your area. Um, let's look at um, psychology. And actually I need to add APA because as I learned from John a few years ago, actually, um, the American Psychological Association has worked with a vendor called Cogbooks to create um, some psychology OER. Um, and I will add that to this guide. Um, but I mean, I think you can't do much better than having the main professional organization uh, sort of rubber stamp, you know, approve an OER. Um, so um, these are generally, the way I've organized this is that there are textbook collections you can look at. Um, I personally like the Open Textbook Library um, as a place to start. Uh, they usually have reviews from people who have actually adopted the books. Um, OpenStax is out of Rice University and they have been, um, been around for quite a while. So they're a pretty reputable source as well. Um, I will say this, I know of some general areas uh, and some sites to look for OER, but really when it comes to evaluating OER, your subject knowledge um, is really going to be 
uh, one of the key factors that I certainly cannot uh, comment on. But there are a few uh, things you might want to look for. Um, accessibility, obviously, uh, should be a priority. Um, you want to make sure that um, the uh, interface is not too clunky. Um, I know one of the uh, issues that is very common in web-based things is something called a keyboard trap, where basically somebody who um, may not be using a mouse, but just a keyboard, um, you know, they'll hit tab and go to the next item and it'll just sort of get stuck. And you're in the Bermuda Triangle of the interface. So obviously any sort of problem like that um, would really affect the ability of your students to access, or at least some of your students to access, um, the course materials. Uh, usage rights may or may not be important. Um, if you just want to use something that is already created, then you probably don't need to worry too much about uh, whether you can make derivative works or not. Uh, however, if it is something that you think you might want to remix a few different sources, um, then it is important to look at the usage rights. Um, comprehensiveness and content accuracy, relevance, uh, all of those sorts of things are going to be uh, related to your subject expertise and you will be able to determine that. Um, I think clarity, uh, consistency, again, these are things that I think are going to be really uh, dependent on your subject area. Uh, and last but not least, uh, look for cultural relevance. Um, you really don't want something that is uh, well, racist or um, ableist, things like that. Uh, so, and if you can use materials that um, are inclusive and uh, demonstrate um, or include people from various races, ethnicities, abilities, that sort of thing, um, all the better. Um, and here are some other evaluation tools that you might find interesting. Um, we had grant money from SUNY. They are sort of redirecting their funds uh, as of last year. So we do not currently have funding opportunities, um, but hopefully we will in the future. And I think that about wraps it up with two minutes to spare. And since there's no one here, I'm going to assume there are no questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Laura.